Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, where we discuss all sorts of things Germanic heathenry related. My name is Jesse. I am your host. Let's get into it. everyone welcome back to another episode of the random heathen ramblings podcast thanks so much for coming back here and seeing what we ramble on about today um, as you've noticed here recently we have kind of branched off from the beaten path as it were kind of gone off the beaten path into some territory that is not typical for heathen conversations but somehow we always find commonalities and nuances and things that can just you know wrap things up in uh in in this podcast in a way so we're not entirely veering off the, the heathen topics, um, but today's episode is going to be very much central, centralized around things that mean a lot to us as heathens. We're going to be talking today with a guest, his name is uh, Bradley, and he, he hit me up on Facebook and um, asked about ancestry specifically, um, which of course for all of us as, as heathens, you know, our, our views on ancestor veneration, I think, can, can pretty much be summed up as everybody that is heathen uh, has a place for the importance of ancestor veneration in their practices. Some people may do it a little bit differently, some people may have different uh, perspectives, but the concept, the idea of ancestor veneration is an important one that many heathens worldwide do share. And we're going to be talking today with Bradley because he asked me this question about uh, how far back do we go? with our ancestors. You know, it, it's, it's a thing that we hear all the time, right? I've said it many times about, um, may your ancestors continue to notice you. Um, I sign off all of my podcasts with that phrase. Um, so it bears the question, which ancestors would we even want to notice us? Do we recognize any and all of our ancestors as far back as we possibly can? And kind of what that, you know, uh, how that, or, or rather how that uh, fits into individual practices, maybe group practices. Um, so we're going to talk about that today. We're going to see what Bradley's thoughts are. We're going to hear, of course, what my thoughts are and talk about DNA, ancestry, how far back do we actually go. Um, so we're going to be bringing him in here shortly. Before we do, please be sure to give this video, if you're watching this on the video platforms, a like, thumbs up, um, interact with it in some way. Follow me on all of the socials that are linked in the link tree link in the description and show notes of this podcast. And uh, wherever you're catching this podcast, if it's just an audio version, uh, do be sure to follow, you know, upvote it, uh, download it, all of those types of things. The way that you interact on those platforms does help with the growth of the podcast. The more ears and eyes that we get here on this uh, on this platform or these platforms, the better. So let's welcome in Bradley, who, again, is going to be talking with me today about our ancestors and just how far back do we actually go? All right, folks. Well, I'm joined here today with a, a Facebook friend of mine. His name is Bradley, um, who has been a heathen for I'm not sure how long, but welcome to the show, Bradley. Thanks for, for joining me today. Great to be on here after lots of listening to episodes and actually being on one now. Yeah, I appreciate it. How long have you been listening or, or following the podcast? Probably about the last two years now. I've been listening off and on. Uh, my job I do a lot of, I have a lot of time to listen to things, so anything I can find that's even related and decent really kind of helps move the night along. Okay, cool. Well, I appreciate the, 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 the support, you know? It's nice to know that there's people. Where are you located, by the way, if you don't mind? Um, uh, up in the very, very northeastern corner of Oklahoma, so I'm pretty much right against Kansas, Missouri, and Oklahoma. Okay. I used to travel a lot for a job in the in my. Uh, I, was, I used to do like prisoner transports, and one thing about I uh, Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, that whole area is there. There ain't a whole lot going on. <laughs> no, no, it's, pre it's, it's pretty remote. remote. Yeah, especially where the town I'm in, we're still we're in the edge of the Ozarks, so we're a little bit better. There's some hills, trees, things like that, but yeah, you go west at all, and it's just this is flat, flat and empty. Yeah. Is that where you're originally from? Yeah, yeah. I've I've had family in 
essentially the town I live in or the small surrounding towns for probably five or six generations now. Okay, wow. Yeah, there's a small cemetery near here I can go back, and I think the oldest is great, great, great grandparent at that one. So, wow. I've not, I, I can't think of too many people that I know in my life or I've talked to who can say that like they're, they're in the same vicinity, the same general area as that many of their ancestors are from. Like a lot of people, myself included, have, you know, like uh, uprooted and moved away from where they were born and raised, you know, and found a life somewhere else. Um, so that's pretty, that that's pretty amazing that, that not just you, but people that far back in your lineage have uh stayed in the same same area there's a lot of history there i'm sure oh yeah like for your that, families that small cemetery there's a whole section just dedicated pretty much to people i'm related to it's a small country cemetery but yeah so it's it's really kind of an experience to go out there and take the kids out there too it is you know away from the city out in the country and to mm -hmm. be able to kind of walk them down the line like well this is my grandparents this is their parents on and off. But I do have ancestors more far flung in uh, Colorado and then somewhere out of Missouri. Okay. And then from there, France. <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. So you, your 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 uh, European ancestry is is a lot of French. Uh, yeah. So let's see. My on my mother's side, her grandparents came here from France, and then there's okay. the ones. Where uh, they're buried in Colorado, and then on my father's side, there's a lot of uh, Irish, German, uh, Northern English, like right in the borders, kind of Scotland and England there. Mm -hmm. And then a uh, uh, oh, totally other side of the the ocean, uh, I have a White Mountain Apache heritage too. Apache, okay. Yeah, you might be the first person that I know in my, uh, that that is that has claimed uh, Apache. Uh, as their indigenous background most people that i have come across living where i live uh always uh have cherokee yeah oh, uh, well, ancestry you know <laughs> here in miami where i live i mean this is uh i think technically one of the cherokee reservations so yeah there's yeah. a ton of that but you know i think it's fort sill where they moved uh the mm -hmm. apache to and that's where geronimo's buried and so that's where that branch, my ancestry, kind of started in Oklahoma and moved up to this area. Interesting. Very cool. And um, have you been heathen your whole life, or did you come into this through another path or another way? So I've been heathen for about 12, it, it's 12 years now, yeah, because it was, uh, yeah, past April. So it's 12 years now. Before that, I was just kind of a, at least as early as you know, a little kid understands religion. Uh, I was kind of, I guess, eclectic pagan would have been the right term for it. You know, I knew I believed that there were gods, that there were spirits, uh, that there was, you know, a magic and things like that. But living in small town Oklahoma, really, before you had access to the internet, you were kind of, you know, trying to teach yourself off scrap. So mm -hmm. you couldn't really be super focused on like i can be now with you know uh, more norse reconstruction it was a well i have this mythology book on celtic lore uh here's a little bit of something from a wiccan spell book i can maybe read <laughs> it was yeah. just a, a hodgepodge of what you could actually get your hands on interesting yeah and i can't imagine that rural town oklahoma has uh, or had a, a really extensive uh, library of, of source material to no to tap into right <laughs> no, it, it was for, i your your best shot was to just go and look at stuff purely from a mythological standpoint say like well okay mm -hmm. here's a book of myths which is which is obviously useful and informative and you know i i love mythology on its own but yeah. trying to build any kind of worldview or practice from just that especially when you're you know 10 11 12 is mm. kind of a challenge <laughs> yeah yeah i don't think you can really use the mythology to 
formulate worldviews. No, you, you have to understand the, the, the culture of the people and, uh, you know, see things from a societal standpoint versus a, a mythological standpoint, you know? It, it's very much putting the cart before the horse. That's mm. why I'm telling people, you know, like, oh, well, I've, you know, I don't know anything, but I've got, you know, some Eddas and things like that. I'm like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's yeah. going to be great stories. They're going to be very interesting. You know, you're going to enjoy them. But there's a lot of contextualization, things like that, that are just totally either going to go over your head or you're going to take in a very different way than it might have been originally. Like, yeah, yeah, I think I think you're right, you know, because the myths are, are, are framed around how the, the, the cultures lived and, and how these people viewed the world, you know, so the stories are, are based around that. And without knowing that first or, or having an understanding of that, you're, like you said, putting that cart before the horse. And I've said this, too, for a long time is like people are uh, that, that that just seems to be the thing. You know, when when people get asked, oh, what, what should I start reading? How many comments do you see on your social media that it's like one of the first things people always say is, is get the prose edda, read the poetic edda. Yep, it's always the so edda, like, yeah. especially the album all, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah, look I like, think... go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think part of that is A, because like I said, they're they're very readable. You know, they're meant to be stories that are told and enjoyed around a campfire and, you know, mm. people can pick those up and read them and you know like i said you might be missing the contextualization but you can still go well that was a fun story i enjoyed reading that whereas as i if i say you know well here's the culture of teutons or you know the the one-eyed god these very dry very scholarly words you know yeah. someone who's not used to that they just kind of you know it can be a real just challenge for them and then also just availability, you know. I mean, I can go to any big chain bookstore usually and find copies of the Eddas, whereas those yeah. other books, you either aren't going to find them or you're going to have to look online. And half the time, there's, you know, some of them aren't cheap. And that, exactly. You know, whereas Eddas, you can, like I said, go to a local bookstore, 10 bucks, have a copy. Yeah, I recently shared... Um like my recommended reading list, some of the books that you mentioned already are on that list. And, uh, but good luck trying to find some of them. Yeah, or, I, you know, if you do find it, be ready to drop some serious change to own a copy. Yeah. I mean, you know, or anymore, if, if I'm my recommended book list, I make sure that I have PDFs where, or physical copies I can loan out either one. So I can say, well, try to get it if you can't, you know, if it's just not viable for you, whether mm -hmm. because you know, cost of entry, availability, I will find a way to get it. it yeah. you know, I can't help you, you know, I can't make you read it once I give it to you. I, <laughs> but I can at the very least get it into your hands. Yeah. So you mentioned a thing earlier that uh, folks on that have followed the podcast, I'm sure, are aware of. And I've said it many times about the type of pagan that I am, or the heathen that I am, is you mentioned being a Norse Reconstructionist. Yeah. Um, so would you consider yourself a, a Reconstructionist heathen? Yeah, I don't I don't take quite a, a super like hard line on it as some people I've seen where, you know, it's, it's perfect. Yeah, the hardcore recons. Yeah. Uh, it's one of those things I always remind myself I can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You know? mm. Because I always view it as, for me, as a, in Reconstruction, uh, when you're building a home, you need a good foundation, but you also still have to build the home on top of it. Yeah. So for me, the Reconstruction part is all about creating that good, solid foundation. But at the same time, I also have to have Earth Cult, UPG, things like that which is the actual house I'm going to live on, live in, that I have to build on top of that. And, you know, you can't always, you know, the foundation and the house aren't going to be identical. They're parts of each other, but... Right. Yeah, not both, everybody's house is the same. Yeah. You know, it's going to be different. You might both have similar foundation, you know, mm. but the house you build on it, it's and even that's going to have similarity. But at the end of the day, it's still got to be your house. 
I like that analogy, you know, using the, the reconstruction a- aspects of this as the foundation to build your uh, house on. And I like how you mentioned also hearth cult, um, because, you know, when I first came into heathenry almost, uh, I'd say almost nine years ago. So I'm a little behind you on, on the, 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 the time frame. I came into this path from being Christian before, you know what I mean? So when you want to talk about like worldviews, um, you know, this path has, has, has a worldview that is very different from a Christian worldview. So it was like rep- get, having to be, be reprogrammed in a way. Yeah. Um, and you don't learn that stuff from the edits. You know, you don't get that, um, that, 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 that level of information from, from the edits, like you said. So did you have something similar with you? I know you mentioned, you know, you were more of an eclectic type pagan uh, earlier on. And then, you know, about well, over a decade ago was when you came into to heathenry. Did you already like was it was it difficult for you to shift your worldviews or were you already kind of in, in line with things that you later on learned are Germanic heathen worldview? It, it, it's a little bit of A and B. I mean, there were already bits and pieces there, especially because, you know, not only was I think paganism, you know, I also was a longtime Tolkien nerd. So, you know, I had already taken so much of that is based on Germanic concepts, myths, things like that. So that helped a little bit too. But oh yeah, there was a culture shock because I don't I don't think there's any way to avoid the culture shock, at least in my opinion, if you're really going to come fully into heathenry. Because even just the religious side of you know, the religious part aside. So mm-hmm. much of our culture is radically different than, you know, the pre-Christian Germanic conceptions. So you are going through this culture shock of like, oh, now luck is a real thing that I have to think about. Mm-hmm. And reputation matters, whereas in our culture, you know, it's like, oh, don't worry. You know, don't worry what people say about you. It's what you think. Well, now all of a sudden it's no, it's flipped on its head and, you know, yeah. world accepting versus world rejecting and, you know, it's just this list of things, and you know, there's the extra weight of the fact that most of us are trying to do this a on our own, and b in it while still being in the original culture. You know, a lot of times if you're adapting to a new culture and going to this culture shock, you're in that new culture, you're surrounded by it, mm-hmm. and that helps you ease you into it because you don't have a choice. Whereas us, you are still surrounded by the original culture and trying to move yourself mentally, emotionally, you know, through your relationships into this new culture without that, you know, structure around you to help. So you're yeah. just pushing yourself through from the ground up. Yeah. And, and how hard has it been for you to, you know, because w- the way I see heathenry really thriving is at the tribal level like there people need to be with each other for heathenry to really shine like yeah. the, the 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 world views the values the 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 morals the ethics all of these things cannot happen without tribe or without that close interconnected you you know sort of like a extension of the family unit um yeah. existing and yeah. It's that concept even nowadays in modern times is so far removed from the majority of people. It's it's so discouraging, you know, when you talk about wanting to bring people together or or establishing some sort of like tribe or kindred or whatever group, you know, name you want to put to it. Um, you know, without people really, like you say, getting into the the studies of the cultures and 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 how it was and how it worked at at a at a time way back when without that it's like again like you know it's an uphill battle Uh, at least what i've found it's not not saying it's it's you know not worth trying and not worth keeping at it but it's definitely tough to get those things happening at least in my area oh yeah and i mean so much of our overculture is just it's anathema to you know these concepts where like i said you were talking about, you know, bring the importance of the group practicing together, uh, you know, how our relationships grow and change throughout this worldview. Whereas, you know, modern, especially American society, it's 
mm. you know, hyper individualized, hyper capitalized, hyper, you know, separation from the natural world. You know, it's all of these things where it just wants to make it as hard as, as possible because, you know, that's yeah. that's what keeps butts in seats at, at jobs and that's what keeps the industrial machine rolling. You know, yeah. they don't, the idea of people being more reliant on each other, that's not good business. So, you know, we have structures in place to kind of prevent that. Yeah. People being more what open to growing their own food and being more involved in creating their own food, you know, that's not good for business. So that's a they throw yep. you know, stuff in that way. So yeah, it's it's a very uphill battle, but like you said, it's entirely worth it. It just those first I usually tell people the first three to five years are gonna be rough. Because you're gonna mm. go honeymoon period and then it's gonna get hard. That and also, you know, when, when we talk about the practice of it, the doing of it, right, uh, how much of what is done or, or what was done, you know, like we're going to be talking about ancestry here soon, you know, and, and veneration of ancestors and how far back do we go. And we're going to talk a bit about that. Um, one of the things about ancestry is is inheritance and, and the things that were passed down from descendant to descendant, land being a big one, yeah. you know. You used to have at one point in time part of the Germanic culture where families, the deceased were buried on old all lands, the ancestral lands. That's not a thing, at least not here in America. And look at how hard it is to even own a piece of property, how expensive it is, um, the, 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 the legal red tape that you have to go through in a lot of areas, right? It's, yeah. it's damn near impossible for aspiring young people, especially nowadays, to want to do to start that even if they want to it's it's damn near impossible yeah absolutely it is i mean it like i said it's that thing to make it more difficult for individuals or even group of individuals as opposed to corporations big business things like that it's where mm -hmm. you, you know a person like you or me we can't throw eight hundred thousand dollars at purchasing a property and you know not think about it but lots of other bodies of, out there can. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, we're uphill battle playing with kind of a stacked deck, but we yeah. also have a ton of choice. True. Rock in the hard place, I guess. <laughs> yeah, true. You know, and it's it, it's the types of things that, you know, you, can, we ha you have ambitions to, to achieve or, or, or things that you want to achieve. I mean, we're, we, we're really only limited to what we apply ourselves to do. I think in, in many cases, it's, it's not that it's, it, it, it's not unattainable. It's like I guess it's, it's damn near impossible. It's, it's very difficult. It's, but it's not, I don't think it's unattainable. You know, like you say, you just make the right choices. Uh, think of the right, you know, come at, come at it from the right angle and it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen right away. Um, you know, people that, I've, I've, I've been of the, of the mind for a long time that the, the type of people who want to see this, things happen that, that share in the same kind of vision as you will come to you. You know what I mean? Like you're not going to have to really go looking for it. It's, it's, it's if you're doing certain things a certain way and, and people see that, they're going to be like, oh, this guy, gal, whatever. They're, they, they're, we, we align. Yeah. And, and let's make things happen together. And then that's where, that's where the magic happens. You know, you get more hands. The many hands do make light work. You know, you get more people actively wanting to, to see this come to fruition. It's all about forming those communities and the bond. I can always tell people, if you look at any, you know, minority community in this country, whether they're ethnic, religious, uh, nationality, you know, a lot of them are going through the same thing. They are, you know, trying to hold on to or create a culture, you know, inside of a society that's either indifferent or hostile to it. And they have to find ways to manage that, grow through that. And, you know, what the number one thing they do is they form a community. Mm -hmm. you know, that's so much just isn't accomplishable on our own unless you're, you know, some kind of super human, you know, luck the size of the Himalayas kind of guy. I have a person go through that. <laughs> yeah. But with that community, all of a sudden, things become 
possible that would never have been possible on your own door open that never otherwise would have been open. Yeah. Um, I agree. You know, uh, I, I've worked uh, for the last few years uh, to have a, a small group of people that I would consider kith, right? That extension of the kin, uh, yeah. that, you know, that, that, that family unit. Um, and, and with that has come obligation, of course, and with that have come uh, certain challenges, right? The, the tribe that was is not the tribe that is and is also not the tribe that will be, I'm sure. Um, it, it's, it's constantly growing and evolving and shape and shif shifting, sh you know what I mean? Uh, it doesn't stay the same uh, all the time. So it's, it's, it's a constant work in progress. Yeah, but that's, that's one of the things I always tell people when they're talking about groups is a lot of people want to create something very rigid that will stay the same forever and, you know, mm -hmm. throw enough rules at it to beat any problems before they happen. Unfortunately, that's not really how human beings work. So oh, you know, yeah. I tell people, you've got to be open to change. You've got to be open to the fact that people are going to come with their issues. That they're gonna so we can be there, you know, be there to kind of help help them through those and grow through them, or you know, just you know, not get bogged down by it. Uh, changes in the practices and information. You know, it, you can't just carve something out of stone. And say this is it forever, and freak out anytime it tries to change. Yeah, it's just gonna erode away to sand. Yeah, that, and also, you know, if, if people try to form or establish groups so strictly as based around the way certain groups were established or formed in in our cheating times, yeah. uh, again, looking at you know from a cultural standpoint, like. Yes, the world really hasn't grown, but it was a smaller, it, it was smaller back then. You know what I mean? Like the, it wasn't as big of a place for these people. And, and it was also how, you know, feudal cultures, war bands and, and stuff. Uh, I mean, they were, they were, they were sure they were agriculturally inclined. They were farmers and, and, and doing all the things just to live off of the land. But uh, there was, there were, there were the war bands that, that had a very militant, structure to it and it's just like here in modern day you know what i mean the way that the military is the way that the you know police forces and, and all these other sort of uh militant or organizations are structured is way more you know ca carved in stone in terms of you know chains of command and 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 whatnot than than the average uh you know joe going down the street going to their jobs or whatever so i don't know i've, I've seen i've seen groups get formed um under the banner of heathenry, let's say, that become very, they, 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 they dissolve because of that over rigidness. You know, you, guess what, guys? You're not a war band. <laughs> this isn't, you know, yeah, sure, you, may, you might can use titles and things to describe your, your, your group or your structure, but um, it ain't the same as it was, you know, a thousand years ago or more. Yeah, and it's kind of a, a cart before the horse situation. Again, I, I see it, I've seen it so many times. Groups are like, they're in love with these very lofty titles, you know, well, we have chieftains and Throttons and Skulls and, you know, and Githia and Gothai and just all these. I, my question usually then is like, okay, well, that's, that's great, but do you have, you have a brew, who's your brewer? You know, who's mm -hmm. your, who's your, uh, your baker? Do you have a blacksmith? Do you have somebody who maybe knows herbal medicine? Uh, is someone doing your sewing, your weaving? Because those are the things that really build connection in a side of a group and that groups need as opposed to, you know, this very formal, rigid political structure, you yeah. know, that, yes, if you are cheating times, especially like, oh, well, this is a group of, you know, dozens to hundreds of individuals. Yeah, you need that. But when there's six of you, you're better off going, well, this is this is Sam. And he brews the mead or the beer for our rituals. And he's, you know, he's very important to us because this is a very important role. And, mm. you know, if that person feels like they're really contributing something concrete to the group. And then the people on the receiving end also 
feel like they're getting something solid and you know tangible out of that relationship as opposed to saying well this is this is someone whose role is largely ceremonial and might be useful once in a while this is no this is sam i mean if he if he left or was hurt or something we would be in real trouble you know mm-hmm. because he is a brewer this is important for you know sally she makes all the bread loaf fresh for our offering you know this is this is really important and we you know there's an appreciation there that goes a lot deeper than just you know this largely ceremonial title mm. you know, i always tell people like focus on on concrete roles in a group you know so that you're getting this physical give and take of things you know even if it's outside of a ritual context, like, well, this is this is a you know our member, and he studies blacksmithing, and you know he creates stuff for the group, and you know maybe we all get together and we you know pitch in and we buy him an anvil, yeah. and you know, because his contribution to our group is important, even outside of a ritual context, you know, just having someone with skills and abilities is important more important in my mind than just very lofty titles that are largely ceremonial because those are the kind of things that really build relationships that last yeah i definitely can see that and you know uh i think some of the pitfalls that can happen are like you say putting that cart before the horse people think well i have to have we have to have this you know uh title and and structure but why like what's the purpose um and number one, number two is who did you give yourself this title? Are you now this person that you think you are or 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 are you doing the things that this title with, the, with that that a person with that title does? You know, yeah. are you a Gothi just because, you know, you say you are or, or have you done the things that Gothis do? Or whatever, yeah. you know what I mean. So again, it 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 goes back to again like worldviews and stuff, which we could do a whole episode on just that. But how worth was was placed, um, and how that applies in modern times. You know, you are worth what your what your group, what your people say you're worth, and and worth is given to you through your deeds. It's you know, it's not just because oh I've been a heathen for twelve years or ten years or twenty years. You know. Yeah, or, you know, like, like I said, it's kind of the opposite of our modern culture where, you know, your worth is just based on your own thoughts and feelings, and nobody can tell me what I'm worth, and I know what I'm worth, and, you know, which, mm-hmm. which you know, is nice and has a place, but it you does. Know, it's still, you have to look at that through the lens of, for us at least, of, you know, pre Christian Germanic belief going like, well, yes, it's important that I know my worth and I, I'm familiar with my abilities. But at the same time, my honor and my value derives from the, my inner, from the people yeah. who you know, are in the place to decide that for me. I can't really decide it for myself. Yeah, I've seen it go both ways where um, some groups whose structure is uh, kind of kind of a it, it's, it's very theodish yeah um you know what i mean like where new members come in with no worth they are worth less yeah. um which has again a, an arch even angle taken to it it's we don't know anything about you per se you have to prove your worth and i've taken a bit of an angle with that with our group it's like I'm not saying you're worthless to your face. I'm not going to say like, oh, you ain't worth a damn. You know what I mean? But what I'm saying or what we're saying is that in order for us to have frith, in order for us to establish that obligation, that bond, the the, the things that come with, uh, the, you know, being tied into that frith web, in order for that to happen, you're going to have to see me. You're going to have to know that. I can be of worth to you, and I'm going to need to know that you're of worth to, to me and the rest of us. We have to see this happen, but there needs to be that time, of uh, that, that period of time to prove yourself and to prove myself and to prove ourselves. Because without that, we're just, uh, you know, going down through a checklist saying, do you do this? Do you like that? Would you? Go- oh, cool. You're 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 in. Yeah, you're you're, you're part of the tribe now. You're you know, it doesn't work that way in this in the, in the Germanic sense of of 
of how the tribe functions, you know, we're obligated yeah. to one another, we rely on one another. And you can't establish that without actually doing things and, and proving it. Yeah, and like I said, you, you have to ignore abstraction wherever you can and focus on concrete, you know, real world tangible things. And like with the worthing thing, you know, uh, an important thing I always say to remember there is those of us who have been in heathenry for a while, if they're going to join a group and someone says, you need to worth yourself, prove your worth, you know, you are without worth until it is proven. If, if you kind of built up that worldview, you understand, you go, well, yeah, of course, uh, obviously, you know, you don't, you don't know my, my worth other than, you know, what I might have said, or a few other people might have said, of course, I've got to prove it. But people who are new to heathenry and still kind of coming out of that modern American overculture, that's a really shocking thing to hear, you know, because, yeah, again, you know, your worth is given to you by yourself. And, you know, anyone questioning your worth is this super offensive, super derogatory thing that, you know, is, is very kind of taboo. Yeah. So that's one of the things with that kind of language I always am careful with. If, if they're new, I ask them, you know, like, how long have you been in this? What is your experience? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they're saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm fairly new then I, I still use those concepts and even that wordage, but I'm always kind of extra careful to explain the whys and the hows and yeah. the mechanics behind it. So like I said, yeah. if you're new and you hear those words, it, they can be pretty off-putting. You know, like, yeah, and it might it, 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 it might deter them from wanting to pursue it anymore because they oh, damn, what am I getting myself into here? Yeah, you know what it, I mean? <laughs> oh, what a, what a bunch of snobby elitists, you know, they, yeah. <laughs> snobs, they're elitists, you know, they're gatekeepers, right? Yep. Well, well, yes and no. I mean, yeah, I mean, we're keeping the gate to our inner. That's important. Yep. We're not saying the gate is locked forever, but you have to, and you know, prove that you are the kind of person we want to let through that gate first. And that's not a bad thing. No. Um, so let's go into a little bit about what this this episode is intended for. I love talking with someone who gets this stuff, um, and uh, and 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 we can have meaningful conversation about it. So, you know, some of the things that we're talking about here are 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 real. You know, it, it's more of the it's beyond heathenry one one type stuff. You know what I mean? Like this is refining worldviews and and really getting into the meat and potatoes of it. Um, so with ancestry. You know, I know you, you've probably seen me say dozens of times, hundreds of times, if you know, if you've been watching for the last couple of years, the podcast is right. May the gods continue to notice you. May your ancestors smile upon you. Uh, that's like how I sign off every episode, but also just the, the importance of ancestor veneration. Um, you had a you had a, 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 a purpose behind talking about ancestry specifically, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'm just going to. If you don't mind, let you verbalize that to to everybody today. Like, what's what are we going to be talking about with regards to ancestry? Well, the question I came to you with, because you know I was interested on your perspective, and you know we'll be talking about that is when it comes to ancestry and ancestral veneration. Uh, you know, how far back do you go? Because this is something that if you ask that question on a heathen group, even season heathens the answer is going to run across the board mm. you'll see people say only the ancestors i've personally known in life or you know this legal code says six to nine generations of ancestors have to be recognized so that's what i do or people who say you know all of them all the way back forever known or unknown uh all the way back to either you know ask and imbla or you know i've seen people you know, say, well, part of my veneration is is the first ape that stood upright. So, you know, it's that question. Wow. Of, yeah, I mean, I it's not my practice, but I've seen it. Yeah. So it's one of those questions of when we say ancestor veneration and venerating our ancestors, what is what do we mean kind of precisely by that? Because it's it's a super, you know, once again, if you're new and you say, which of my ancestors do I venerate? One person says the last three generations, and one of them says 
all the way back to, you know, your earliest Homo sapien ancestor, those mm-hmm. are dramatically different practices to tell a person this is what yeah. we do. Yeah, and that's a great point. Uh, it, and it's one that I've made on other topics as well. You know, you get 10 heathens in a room and ask the same question, you're probably going to get 10 different answers yeah, or about like- it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. And so that that's the thing where, you know, <clears throat> um, for, for, for me, you know, the the way that I lean into ancestor veneration are, are relatively close, but I don't forget or neglect the ones that are a bit further removed um, because sometimes, you know, you find people like myself who have gone down uh, like Ancestry.com or, or 23andMe or whatever these other sites and, and try to find more about your ancestry, right? Like who was my grandmother's grandmother's grandmother and this and that, right? And try to go as far back as you can through genealogical records and, and stuff. And it can be really, really cool some of the things you find. Uh, you know, like I know that one of my ancestors is John Marshall. You know, the, the the first Supreme Justice of the United States. I know one of my ancestors is Francis Scott Key. Uh, do I do I light candles for the for for John and, and and Francis? I've never done that. You know what I mean? Uh, they don't. To me, they you know they they it's pretty cool. Like they 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 have a really they have a very strong they have very strong refrain. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because of the things that they've done. Um, but are they? so close to me in, in, in my practices that I venerate them. I, I say I don't, but it's not to say that I should or should, you know what I mean? Like, right. I just don't. Um, my ancestral veneration is, is a bit more closer to my heart and to the, to, to the ancestors that I've either known or who have become known to me through whether it was parents or grandparents right throughout my life that have told me stories about them. Right. I didn't know my grandfather on my dad's side very well because he died when I was very young. He died the year my sister was born. I was like three, you know what I mean? So I I have no memory of him, but I know that he fought against the Germans during world war two. And he, you know, was sunk in a U boat off the coast of North Carolina. So I think that those types of things are, are very heroic and very, uh, you know, important things to remember. And so in my ancestor veneration, whether even though I didn't immediately know him, he's close enough in my ancestral line, right? He's my father's father, to make a point of speaking of his of his deeds and remembering him, commemorating him in that way. That's just like as an example. Right. Um there's also, I think, a place to 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 uh to bring up of not all of your ancestors are worth your veneration. That's at least true. not to me. Some people's ancestors, myself, I mean, all of us, you know, people have done some really shitty things and <laughs> we don't want to remember that. We don't want to commemorate them for the terrible things that they've done. We'd rather than be forgotten. And that's pretty powerful stuff because, again, it goes into the 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 worldview of, of the ancient Germanic heathens is to, you know, you know that your name, your reputation never dies of those who have earned it. But if you've done really nefarious things, if you were needing, if you were outlawed, if you were gone and outside of this, the 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 sanctity, the the protection of the of the inner, uh, you were you were just assumed as dead, you know, and and gone well, and forgotten. Worse than dead, you become less than human. You know, you're mm-hmm. a mark. You know, you're a troll. You're you've been stripped of your humanity through being stripped of that that familial relationship. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm kind of in the. I I think I kind of lean more towards, you know, I don't necessarily neglect my long distant ancestors. I just don't have a, a very active place of venerating them as much as I do those who have been more involved in my life. And why would that be? Right? Why would you not? light a candle or or have a ceremony or do something to remember the first supreme justice of the united states well damn like that's a pretty important guy why wouldn't you i, don't know, I wasn't around like none of my none, none of the people that are related to him through or to me through them through him right none of our ancestors are alive anymore 
to, to, to know much about him other than what are written in the history books and, and that have been passed down yeah. through the annals of history. You know what I mean? The story so, that there's no relationship. Yeah. And I, and I see this with, uh, you, you probably have too. Like I see this with people who are like, well, my descent, I'm the descendant of Ragnar or I'm oh. a descendant of this King or I'm a descendant of this, you know, great hero. I'm like, that was a long ass time ago. Yeah. You think that they know you, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't You're really. I, I don't, yeah. I mean, that may be so maybe you do have, you know, uh, lineage that, that is documented that far back. I'm not saying, you know, that you're wrong if that's what you are, 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 are claiming. And if you have the documentation, prove it. But what does it really do? What does that really prove? Yeah. So you're, you know, so you're King so-and-so's, you know, great, 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 great nephew. He had no idea about you. Why, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, yeah. So for that, me, it's, it's like, it's cool, but what, what, why would you have that as part of your, your hearth cult? Yeah, that, that luck has changed hands so many times at this point that it is a radically different luck than the one that he passed down when he died. You know, so, again, you have this story, but you don't have much of a relationship. And part of that, too, is going back to that uh, obsession with titles, you know, that validation through these very lofty, abstract titles. I'm not just anyone, I'm the... Mm-hmm. Eight times removed grandson of Ragnar Lothbrok. So therefore, you know, listen to me. Like, well, yeah, that was why? different back then too. You know, because that actually meant something. You know, if you received an audience with an important person, that was kind of like your way in. Like, who is who is who's Jesse? Oh well, Jesse, he is the son of so and so. Who was the son of so and so? Who did this thing, that, or the other? Ah, uh, okay, you know. That like it meant something. Like there was, you would be announced as such. You would be yeah. known as such. I mean, but like you say, the luck has, has has changed so much over the years. Like so, the luck that that was passed down through 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 Orlog, you know that, that that that's the waters are a bit murkier now than they were back then. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because there's been so much other things that have been added to the well that have changed the, the structure of that luck that was passed. Yeah, that layer is so deep now that you know it's it's not really the ones you're drawing from. But it's, yeah, you know, it's still part of it. It's in there, but you know it's deep as opposed to that surface levels of Orele that yeah, you're Orle. really drawing freshly from. What about you? You asked me. I answered. What about you? What, <laughs> what, what is your <laughs> what's your stance on it? <laughs> so similar. Uh, similar. The ones I focus most on are the ones that are more recent and, you know, either I've known or, you know, I know through stories of the people who knew them. So like my great grandfather, I never met him, but, you know, he was very close to my father. And so, you know, I've seen images of him. I know stories about his life. Uh, You know, I have items that he had when he was alive that you know are mine now uh, i have i literally have a cast iron cooking pot that he cooked out of that i cooked for my family out of now you know, mm. these things you know he has a place but you know yeah. once uh, uh a good example would be i can on one side i can as reliably as these records can be traced you know it goes back to like a uh a longobard ancestor named gundol you know, I that's so many generations ago. <laughs> Do yeah. I really need to have, you know, something on my altar for Gundol? Uh, I don't. Uh, the most like that in my practice reflects is uh, I make sure it, it practice uh, factors into my practice with Rika, you know, because of the story of how she uh, helped the Longobard people. Mm-hmm. And in their names and things like that. So, you know, little things in Hearth Cult like that, but not on the altar. Like, so the altar has pictures of people that I knew or knew the stories, uh, yeah. items that have been handed down to me, things like that. You know, people whose, you know, the luck I have reflects the luck that was passed down by these people. Now, that's not to say that I just, you know, I don't want it to sound like these are the only ones. Involved mm-hmm. in the practice, 
because that can be a, a misconception people get when you say something like that. Like, well, I mainly venerate this number of generations, you know, three to five ish of the ones I knew, you know, because the older ones, I believe, are still very much sentient. You know, they exist in however you want to view the afterlife. You know, they have a presence and they have power. You know, they still exist. It's just the fact that they're probably not super worried about me on a personal level. You know, it's kind of in the same way that, you know, my mother who's passed is a spirit who's probably pretty concerned with my well-being and yeah. seeing me succeed because, you know, I was her son. We were very close. And even then I have to, you know, keep in mind, I have three siblings. She looks after them as well. And, you know, she's not omnipotent and omnipresent. You can only be in one place at one time. So, yeah. you know, while I get a lot of attention from that spirit and then, you know, onto my grandparents, it's the same thing, you know, they're close and I'm sure they look over me and my practice a lot, but they still have other grandchildren. They still have living children that I'm sure they have to keep an eye on maintaining the family. And the farther you get back, you know, it, it's this wider and wider pool of people for them to, to worry about and look over. Uh, you know, it becomes less a case of they're going to be worried about you and more they're going to be worried about this branch of the family mm. or, you know, this half of the family or, you know, the entire family. And that's when I started just referring to them, you know, like as the Alpha and the DC or, you know, I don't know your names and I probably don't have a super personal relationship with you, but I recognize that you are still part, a part of the family. You mm -hmm. exist are sentient and are part of the kinfolk and yeah. that are doing things to help it may not be immediately relevant to me every time you know you might not be making sure my air conditioner doesn't break down at an inopportune time but you are making sure say that my branch of the family is avoiding some bit of ill luck that might have happened or you know we are moving in the right direction mm. uh I liken that to kind of how many of us, especially like in Reconstruction, will talk about how the gods are not super worried about us on a personal level. You know, yeah. King Vitre is making the crops grow for everyone in my area, not just me, you know, but I still benefit from that gift. You know, yeah. it's important that I reciprocate that gift and, you know, value that, that relationship. Now, once ancestors get so far back, it becomes a very similar situation where they're not helping me maybe as an individual, but they are still giving gifts to the family that I am reaping benefits from. So mm -hmm. while my focus and like, like I said, the altar is focused mainly on more recent ancestors, anytime I'm verbalizing that, like say in prayer or offerings, I do, you know, make it clear that, you know, to my ancestors and, you know, to the Alpha, the DC, or my ancestors, I know and don't know, both because, you know, I believe I'm reciprocating that relationship, even if it's not a super personal one. And also because, the, you know, the dead are powerful. The dead are, are dangerous sometimes. And mm -hmm. if they are listening in, uh, I really don't want to be the one that makes them feel slighted. <laughs> Right. Where, uh, you know, I'm leaving them <laughs> out a kind of a, a maleficent type situation where, you know, this is the day the five times removed great grandfather decides to, to check in on things and make sure mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm bringing honor to the family. And <laughs> he feels left out. And all of a sudden he he's dipping out of that that reciprocal relationship. So like I said, mm -hmm. I tell people, well, focus on your recent ancestors that you have this relationship with that you know, but also recognize that there are these deeper relationships going on that you may not immediately recognize, but which are still valid because, you know, even when they're dead, they don't leave the family. Yeah. I mean, not for them personally anymore, but they're still there. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a great, that's a great summary and, and explanation of it. So thanks for sharing. I, uh, I was wondering something too, and I wanted to 
bring this up during this episode because this is a this is an aspect of things I think that a lot of people can relate to, and that is on the on the on the topic of fostering adoption, right? Because ancestry, when we talk about it, the first thing that people think of are our blood kin, the people who we are related to through blood that have sired, you know, descendants where and now we're here. Um, but not everybody has that connection. The people who they are closest to in their life are not related to them through blood. They are related to them through fostering, adoption, that sort of thing. So their luck, uh, you know, like th that family's luck, does it get passed down to the adopted or the fostered uh, and, and so on and so forth? Um, and what are your thoughts on that? So my answer to that is, like you said, this is something that comes up a lot because it's not an uncommon question in our age. And, you know, it's something that probably as long as there's been human, things like adoption have existed. Sure. Because we're a social species and things happen. Right. So my answer to that is usually when did the adoption take place? So if someone says, you know, well, I was adopted as a baby. You know, my adoptive parents are the ones who gave me my name, who raised me, who took care of me from birth, or even a very young age. You know, I don't re even remember my biological parents. These are the only parents I've ever had. Well, my answer to that is usually focus on on the ones who adopted you because you are, by the Germanic worldview, a legitimate part of that family as much as anyone would be that was born into it. You know, with, once you're adopted in, it's it's like when you graft the limb of a tree onto another tree, you know, it might have originated somewhere else, but it, it is now part of that tree. It lives mm -hmm. or dies with that tree as opposed, you know, if the tree you took it from and grafted it off of dies, that doesn't hurt that branch. It's now part of this tree that it's grafted onto. Mm -hmm. You know, so if it's the case where they're very young and that's the case, I always say just, I would just, and it's a personal thing. Some people, are still going to want that, and you know, I don't think there's harm in that. But yeah. now, if you say older, uh, and you built those relationships, maybe with the family that you know, pre-adoption family, uh, you already created those ties. You're still using the name that they gave you, which is a powerful thing in history. You know, yeah, being named is a is a very serious thing. Uh, that's usually when I get into the fact, you know, I would recommend both, especially like if you're an adult or, you know, sometimes in um, a tribal setting saying, well, we're going to adopt, adopt each other as siblings. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you're not removing yourself from that original family. You're just kind of embracing each other's kinship. So now, yes, you have to recognize those ancestral ties and relations too, but you don't lose the ones that you had already. Yeah. So, yeah. Younger kids, I say, focus on your adoption. Uh, even in my family, you know, I my first child is technically my stepdaughter. You know, I just call her my daughter. But we had an adoption ceremony, a heathen adoption ceremony. Nice. Uh, you know, where I, I gave her her name and gifts and welcomed her into the family and things like that. And... But she was already old enough, and she still knows her biological father. So when we talk about this, you know, I make it clear, you know, those are still your ancestors, and it's important to acknowledge them, and there's nothing wrong with that. But my family and my ancestors are just as much your ancestors now. You know, my grandmother and the boons that she gave me and the luck she gave me are yours as much as they are mine or any of my other biological children. Yeah. You know, but also doesn't mean that you're removed from your biological father's side because you right. still know him and those people and you know you were given your first name by them and that's you know that's still power yeah no 100 percent. i mean my wife was adopted at birth and um still knows her biological mother her biological father we we don't talk about him much because he was a, a a villain and you know what i mean and we so we don't really and and it's it's crazy. She's not she's not a practicing heathen. She's fully supports what I do. 
she has her own way of, of the views of the world, but she's not a heathen uh, in the in the technical sense of the word, right? She doesn't practice the same things I do. However, um, any time that this her sperm donor is what she calls him, yeah. uh, it, she doesn't even mention his name. Like, doesn't even want to speak his name. Um, she doesn't claim the surname that she was tied to through his, you know, lineage, right? She's yeah. like, I am not a that. Don't ever call me that sort yeah. of thing. She has a very, very strong stance on I am so and so because of who has raised me and who has taken me in and 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 all that. So I think, you know, and, and that's that's definitely been a thing for like you say, you know, pretty much since humanity, right? Things yeah. happen. And uh, fostering was a big part of the Germanic culture too. And I, uh, I know that you know once you were part of that family, you you received the luck and the benefits of that family, same as anybody else who was blood kin. Yeah, you know, you lived and died by that family. Yep. And the way we do our tribe is is, is in a similar way. Like we talked earlier about, like the worthing thing and all that. Uh, once once worth is established and that 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 period of time has lapsed, um, we we enter into the the oath web to pledge our 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 kinship to one another. I don't call people of any, you know outside of my blood kin like I don't call another man brother or another woman's sister or anything like that until there has been that that uh, that, that 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 period of time to to prove our worth to one another and then. Once we've established that we, we understand things similarly, like we then we can comfortably say, all right, now you are my brother. We're not blood related, but you are kin to me now. And with that comes the obligation and the responsibility and the love and the, and the backing and the support that family offers and, and provides. Yeah, it's a very heavy thing. That's why, you know. It's that beaten into the ground of people, you know, getting on a Facebook group and hi brothers, you know, stole and like no, <laughs> we're not brothers. And that that's kind of goes back to that overculture thing again of telling somebody no, we're not brothers can once they're not in the worldview can be a very shocking, you know, off putting thing to them if yeah. you don't get in there like no, you have to understand saying that thing also carries with it this mountain of duties and obligations and you know if i say yes. you're my brother that means that you know i my life is your life I, I even if i think you've done something like this is dumb this is really dumb but i'm here to help <laughs> because yeah. you're my brother and what else can i do because right your problem is my problem even if i think it's a dumb problem <laughs> yeah I mean, I've had experiences throughout, like I was telling you before, how this, the structure of the tribe or, or the, the, how the tribe has evolved in, in time, right? It's not the same as it was when it was init you know, initially created or started, formed. Uh, it's not the same tribe then as it is now. Um, however, you know, even, though, even though people that were in the tribe are, are not part of the tribe, it's not because they've done anything to harm themselves or ourselves uh, on the luck level right they haven't done anything to be considered neither so i still call them brother or whatever right hey you may not come to tribal affairs you're not oath bound but we're not oath bound to one another um but you've also never done anything i know that if i called upon this person they would answer if i needed something they would do the best that they could to provide you know what i mean or, yeah. or answer that call um, but stuff like that again is, is, is like, it's all very cool sounding, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, you know, I answered the call, uh, call on me, brother, and I will answer. Do you really mean that? Yeah. Are you really like, if, if, if this person calls you at two in the morning, are you going to answer that phone call? If not, then they're not your brother, man. Like that's not family. Yeah. It, 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 it's, it's literally that kind of a, of a thickness that it's, it's that how, that's how thick the threads are. That's how strong the bonds are. And I, I've, I've talked about this before. I don't know how you feel like when it comes to Frith and the, and the bonds that get established, there's there's like layers and levels of it, right? Like the Frith bond that I have with my wife is stronger than the one that I have with my my tribal brothers. You know what I mean? Because we've we've done and, and gone through things more than I've gone through with them, her and I, you know? So that 
the, the frith that her and I have is not the same as the frith that my tribe tribesmen and I share. You know what I mean? Yeah. Does that, does that make I, sense I'm for you? Yeah. 100% on board because, you know, uh, I have relatives that are, you know, distant and, or even, you know, just, we don't get along for whatever reason. And, you know, at the most I go, well, Frith demands that I will never actively oppose. Like I will, <laughs> I will never try to hurt you. Or if somebody shows up trying to hurt you, I am not going to help them in any way, shape or form. But past that, it's best if we just avoid each other. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I never be your enemy, but I also don't really want you to come over for dinner. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that that's a layer of frith, you know, those obligations. As opposed, to, you know, like you said, my wife, you know, we, we were joking about the other day. He was like, "Well, I mean, if, if you kill somebody, I've got to help you hide the body." <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. I, I owe you that level of. I I might be complaining the whole time. This is dumb. Why did you do this? Oh my god. Oh, why, baby? Right. But, I'm still going to do it because the level of frith we share demands that, you know, or, you know, the classic taking a bullet, like, well, there's no, there's no doubt there. Like, oh, well, my life is your life. So of course, you know, I would have to put it on the line for any chance to protect yours. Yeah. Whereas the more distant or unrelated, you know, unappreciated relations, you know, it's like, I don't know that I need to die for you, but mm -hmm. I'm, Really not going to help anybody kill you. <laughs> yeah, and and you've got those, all those layers in between. It, it, exactly. It's it's not so, like you said, carved in stone earlier. Right? Like the things aren't so carved in stone. Like there are layers, there are levels, there are nuances, there are variances. Right. So it's it's not so, not so cut and dry. Uh, absolutes, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. It's not one or the other. It's sometimes it's one. Sometimes it's somewhere else in between. Sometimes it's another shade of that part that's in between. Uh, there's again, there's there's layers to it all. Yeah, kind of like you know when I'm discussing and teaching my kids Chris, even if I don't use those words, you know, I make it clear to them, you know, like I am your father, you are my children, and that means that I have obligations. You will never go hungry you know my food will always be your food if you fall on hard times my house will always be your house you know mm. anything you say or do that you think i may not approve of with exceptions of like a really drastic terrible thing are yeah they are nothing against the frit you know so if you came to me and said dad i'm gay or dad i i want to be this religion or now, I want to do something you may not approve of, you know, you know, not like, oh, I did something terrible, you know, nightmarishly bad. Like, you know, I want to I want to do this job and I know you don't approve of it or think it's a good idea, but I'm doing it anyway. Well, once again, those are all yeah. bumps in the road compared to Fritz. That means, you know, like I said, you will never have to worry about those things because as your father, this is my obligation in fifth you that mm -hmm. i will always be in your corner even if i wish i wasn't you know in that particular corner for some reason i go well this is i you really shouldn't have moved into that house i told you was more than a fixer upper but mm -hmm. i am your father and that means i am here with tools and money and yeah you know, i am here no matter what and that, that's something that, you know, I've seen that several times as my kids got older, really hit home with them. Where, like, I can, you know, dad may not like this, but I will never feel in fear of losing my relationship with him or losing my place in the family because that's just not a conflict sort of thing. You know, beyond the pale of that. Yeah. Yeah, that Frith bond is strong. When it, and I, I don't know if you've ever uh, encountered this, but I, I got to thinking about um, situations as, like we're talking ancestry here um, about <clears throat> how close we, we go back or how far we go back. Um, 
but situations where uh because again you know religion is is the big divider for a lot of families you know yeah. and uh family members who are not they don't practice the same things that that we do you know what i mean so let's say you know you have you know your grandmother or, or whoever was a you know was a devout christian and and, and that's how, you know she died and there was all of the the funerary rites all of the things leading throughout her life and up to her death were uh framed around the christian worldview of things does that does that person does that ancestor still carry the same reverence venerance to uh to heathens these days as let's say someone else that is you know was was maybe not as much so um does does the religious the, 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 the does the religiosity transfer through into the experience of, of ancestor veneration i personally don't think so um because i think at that point it becomes obsolete like that was how you lived your life that was how you did things in in the physical experience of of you as a person um now that that part of your life has expired and you have transitioned into the next stage of life, it's not. Yeah, and I and I, I just yeah, I got to thinking about it and I was wondering where if you had any thoughts about that sort of thing or. Yeah. Um, uh, well, first of all, big UPG warning, which. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I yeah. Well, anybody is, that's uh, listened to the show for a while probably is familiar with that phrase, so I, I think I'm safe throwing that out. But. Uh, so what I always tell people is no, well, I'm no, I don't really factor it into it because uh, my way of thinking is, you know, I'm a heathen. I believe in a heathen worldview and a heathen afterlife. You know, I believe a multi-part soul, things like this. So in my mind, my ancestor, even if they were devout Christian, well, once they died, their soul breaks up into some of its multiple parts. You know, they begin the journey to the afterlife, however you want to, the road to hell is how I usually refer to it. You know, they leave behind the leak, the body, all these changes happen. And, you know, they learn things. They learn from the dead, different truths, both known and unknown to us. Mm. And, you know, they there are dramatic changes. So I always tell people like, well, you know, in the same way that my Christian relatives don't, you know, acknowledge the fact that, you know, they think I have a multi-part soul and part of that will be going into, you know, the road to hell and dwelling here and this and that. You know, I also don't overly worry about, you know, trying to make other worldviews and religions fit into mine. I just go well. For what I believe happens after you die, because these are my beliefs. Uh, I, I fully recognize, who knows, maybe I am wrong, but this is the way I practice. So, you know, after they die, they are into things that they're changed through death, through this new knowledge. Yeah. So, you know, yes, grandma might have been a devout Baptist, but, you know, I also <laughs> believe now that in the mound her soul separated in certain ways and it's gone to join the other dead and spoken to them and learned things and returned mm -hmm. now change so that that really doesn't strike me as that big of a factor in the scheme of things i think that's helpful for a lot of people to hear um two heathens discussing this topic uh because i don't know about you but i've been approached about uh, this topic, but not just a specific topic, but the things surrounding this this topic. You know, some people don't know who their ancestors are uh, because their their life has been you know structured around you know uh, be, uh, being very separated from the family unit. Yeah, you know what I mean. And um, so when they come into this path and they hear things about ancestral veneration and the importance of it, they feel lost. They feel they don't have nowhere they have like no baseline nowhere to start like well what do i do how i don't know who they are you know what i mean yeah. and uh or or this person who i do know you know they were they were they weren't the greatest they did this thing that or the other why would i want to venerate that why would i want to you know commemorate their memory and 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 stuff and, and do anything that 
would bring uh you know bring honor to the family or or whatever so there's a lot of uh again here we go into the <laughs> the gray areas you know the, the the things that happen and i think i think ultimately what it comes down to um is it goes back to hearth cult you know if you're trying to find a source if you're trying to find books if you're trying to find you know one specific thing that's going to give you the answer good luck yeah I, on this like you've got to establish your own customs your own traditions yeah like i said if you find that one magical source that lays everything out be, be sure to send me a link yeah please I, let me know <laughs> I would love to have some clarity <laughs> yeah but yeah a hundred percent and you know uh that other one yeah i get that a lot you know i don't i don't know my ancestry at all and there's not really any way for me to learn it you know it's you say this is an important part of he and re, you know is this now just something i have to miss out on mm -hmm. and in that case i usually go back to you know for my beliefs the, the altar and the dc are where you have these ancestors and they are mm -hmm. concerned about you and your well-being it's just not in a personal sense, you yeah. know, they are worried about the greater body of their descendants. So, you know, you can start with your alpha and DC here, and then, you know, you might have, you know, you're from there, you're ground zero, you know, you're, yeah. you're the beginning and it's time for you to leave something for your descendants to remember and cherish and honor. And, you know, you can still, for your hearth cult and your ancestral cult, have those alpha and Dcer that you know are there. They're still part of your orle. You know, they are part of you that can't be taken away from you just because the knowledge is gone. Yeah. But without a name and without a face, you can still use these concepts to have that and then begin working on finding ways to introduce those names and concepts. You know, maybe, you know, like I said, you're the first one and it's your job to start it so that the people that come after you will have people that they know and can honor and remember and keeping sure. that kind of in the back of your mind all the time. Uh, maybe you have chosen family that winds up, you know, becoming family through adoption yeah. and, you know, fostering. And as they pass on, you know, because none of us get any younger. <laughs> and unless sure. you know unless you're one of the early ones to go you're going to lose people sooner or later you know you can be adding those people onto mm -hmm. those altars and into that first call and growing it that way you know it's it's not one of those things where you either have it or you don't it's once again gray and there's levels and layers we all just have to kind of, you know, we're living in the aftermath of a conversion and a dramatic shift in worldview. We have to kind of start where we are, whether it's mm -hmm. easy and convenient or not. Yeah. And here's a, like, this is another thing I was thinking too, uh, probably some definitely uh, UPG, for, um, but maybe some, some, some hints or some uh, glim, glim, glimmers of this happening how many times have we in encountered ourselves but also seen throughout the stories throughout the the sagas of of uh you know people being visited in dreams or or having these like unconscious visions that involve deceased ancestors you know coming to them in in this sort of way and again the, the, it, it probably leans more into like the upg side of things but i mean there's enough examples i think that we can deduce that um again because of how powerful the dead are that uh they are not bound by one or two forms of communication they can reach us we can reach them there are ways to feel connected you know and uh it's a thing it's definitely a thing oh yeah i'm 100 so. with you there because like you said the dead are powerful and, you know, it's, I always say people, I don't believe in the dead as like a concept or, you know, a societal construct or a Jungian archetype. You know, I believe the dead are, you know, present and powerful and exist, you know, are sentient individualized beings. So, you know, and powerful. 
So yeah. they're bound to communicate with me through a variety of ways. If, if that's through dreams, you know, like I said, A, there's, you would be hard pressed to find a culture that does not have some belief that the dead communicate through dreams. Mm-hmm. That, that's one of those things goes, you know, it's present in the Germanic context, but that's practically a human thing. Yeah. You know, the idea that the dead can communicate through dreams and through yeah. all the states. Uh, you know, so yeah, looking to those those hints and feelings of an ancestor that might be wanting to reach out to you and bring you into the fold. Like I said, that's a like we said, that's a lot more UPG, but I also totally agree with it. And you know, there are ways to do that work with that. You know, as yeah. long as it's something you're comfortable with and open to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm a. You know, I'm 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 of that opinion where, we're kind of limited. They're not. Yes, there are there are limitations. You know what I mean. But like you're saying, like the 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 the, the channels of which they're uh, capable of of reaching us are are less limited than the ones that we currently have, <laughs> right? I can't get on a Zoom. I can't get on a live stream or whatever and talk to my grandmother like I can talk to you or other people, right? Um, but that doesn't mean I can't still talk to her or my father who recently passed or, you know, that sort of thing. It's can be done. And, uh, yeah, it's 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 definitely a thing. Yeah, they, they are powerful, individualized, sentient beings that, you know, have greater or lesser interest in being present in our lives and in our well-being and the more we interact with them i feel that the more their vested interest becomes active you know like you can write a letter or, or call or text or some you know whatever people living people like i say like every so often and it's oh it's cool nice to hear from you but the more you interact the more you're involved the more you become intertwined then the more interesting things become there's a more of an investment in that relationship. So if you find that there's a relationship that from a, from a departed ancestor that you're uh, either they are reaching out to you or you feel drawn to them is start that and then continue it. Don't just let it be a, a passing thought, feed it. You know, the more you do it, the more it's going to become an active component to your, your hearth cult and, the things that go on around your life and those that are with you and around you. Uh, at least that's the way I see it. Absolutely. Like I tell people, you know, don't imagine them as just like, you know, some abstract thought phantom, you know, that things like that. Think of them still as a, as a flesh and blood person, maybe one that you can't physically see most of the time, but mm. still that person who has thoughts and opinions and, Things like that. So, you know, yes, communicate with them. Give them gifts. Give them, you know, a place of honor. You know, make a plate for them at dinner sometimes. You know, invite them over for dinner, you know, in your own way. Uh, this may be a very, sorry. Yeah, this may be a very modern twist to it all. Uh, but in the same vein of what you're describing, like I know my wife has done this with uh, like uh, people that she's lost over the years whether they've been ancestral to her or, or, or through like fostering and adoption scenarios, I have become kin to her, no less um, sending them like a text message, writing them an email, doing things like that, that are the physical, uh, you know, expression of communicating. You're not going to necessarily get a response back through those means. However, yeah. the process of doing that can be cathartic and it can also I think at least in, you know, we're modern heathens, right? Like we're living in these times, these things exist. They may not have been a part of the, the worldview or the concepts of, of Germanic heathens at the time, but if they had phones, if they had emails, why wouldn't it be? I, I think of things like that. If the, if the technology existed, would it, could it have been part of the, the, the process, you know, and, and why can't it be now? Absolutely. I mean, like I said, we have to build the house of today on the foundation of what's been left to us in the past. And the, the house of today has a cell phone and it has an email and mm. things like that. So we use them. But yeah, like you said, it's those li- even little things help. Writing breathe. notes. Yeah. Oh. 
you know, it's half good stuff, of open a turned up cup, I found myself a, a friend. It there doesn't there you go. I appreciate the, this dialogue. This has been really, uh, this has been really helpful for me specifically. I love being able to talk to people that have a a, a good, strong, con you know, mind of, of this and the, and the concept surrounding Germanic heathenry specifically. A lot of a lot of the content that I have uh, here, especially here recently, have have gotten off on other paths and have ventured off the branches of reaching out a little bit more, um, which I think is great too. Yeah, you know, and I, uh, nothing, nothing to to say bad about it. But I love being able to talk about stuff that is close to my heart, and 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 share it with people who have questions, you know, and 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 maybe thinking of things like this themselves. And now it gives them, hopefully, the opportunity to uh, explore it more themselves and find it, how it applies for their for their lives. It's not that we're saying, well, this is how you have to do it in order to right. achieve the certain result. This is just again two heathens from different spectrums, different parts of the country, different stages of their journeys, uh, talking and sharing about things that, that can hopefully help, you know, be a, be a, be a guide. Yeah. Which, you know, the more resources you can put out there, the better, because, you know, a lot of people, once again, do not have a community, do not have someone with years of experience they can ask. So they go looking for YouTube videos. They go looking for podcasts. I don't know how many times I've had people say, you know, okay, the books are great, but, you know, I learn better through, like, videos and podcasts and things like that. Do you yeah. have those you can recommend? Like, yep, I have a list, you know. I These are the ones that maybe avoid because I don't really agree with some of the stuff that they're saying or, you know, it's yeah. questionable for a variety of ways. And, you know, you've got these people that are putting out content that even if I don't agree with every single thing they say, they are seem to be stand up people and their information is mostly pretty good. So yeah, give them a listen. Think about what they say. If you have questions, you know, fire them my way if you need to, or you know, mm -hmm. whoever you want to. But yeah, finding podcast videos like this is a huge important resource on top of the book. Especially for modern practice. Yeah, yeah, like I was saying, it's 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 one of the rooms being added to this this house of that's being built, right? <laughs> yeah, We're using exactly. that analogy a lot, and I love it. I yeah, love it, it. It's an important part of that house because I it's one of conversational things like this. A lot of people just learn better than they do a very dry academic scholarly book. You know, yeah, they might they might read it, but actually being able to grasp an idea in a way that they can bring it into themselves and their practice a lot of times conversational stuff like podcasts videos things like that does a better job just on a human level the yeah. books are beyond important you know i cannot recommend enough but if you don't have a community where you can get those also human interactions Stuff like this is just the next best thing because once again, we're human. There's some things that just work better for you. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely glad that we got a chance to wrap about this um, this particular topic and others. I, I think it was a great episode. I hope people that are listening and watching to this uh, now are are finding some some good and useful tips um, and and and. and finding a way their own, you know, to, to expand on it. So I want to say thank you, Bradley, for coming on the, uh, coming on the podcast today and sharing your thoughts and, you know, of course, asking the question to begin with, um, as, as I love it, it's, it's, you know, without people like yourself that are asking questions or that are, uh, looking for others' opinions, uh, the podcast wouldn't be what it is. Um, so I appreciate the, the, con the contribution. Yeah, it's been great. Like I said, it, after hours and hours, obviously, of listening after a couple of years, it, it, it's kind of a little fun and a little surreal to actually be on it. <laughs> I don't, it's going to be a little weird listening to an episode with my voice on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, I don't want to say that this is, you know, the, the, the first or last, but uh, definitely the first, but hopefully not the last. I, I with, with, with stuff like this, I, I leave the the guest with a, an open invitation that if, Hey, something else comes up and you want to 
talk about it again, uh, please hit me up. You know, would love to have you back on. I think after what we've talked about today, I, I would definitely love to have you back on for future yeah. episodes. So if you're ever inclined and want to uh, chat for a bit more and put put something out here, I would love to have you back. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, these things like podcasts, these videos, they are an invaluable resource for getting good information into the hands of people that really need it. You know, like I said, especially people that don't have community that they can either find or build yet. So it's important. It is, I cannot overstate how important it is that we're out here doing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I have the opportunity to do this with folks like you. Um, that, that share in that, interest and that desire to because you know get let's face it like i'm sure you've encountered especially over for as long as you've been uh practicing heathen you know there's there's plenty of people out here that that see knowledge and and things as this sort of you know treasure that needs to be locked away in an ivory tower and never accessible and uh without extreme means of of uh, trying to achieve it and all that it's like come on dude like lighten or, up a little bit you know <laughs> or, or weaponizing it so yeah. They, oh, you don't you don't know that you're yeah. you're trash. You don't. Oh, am I going to explain it to you? Am I going to give you resources? No, I'm not going to do that either. I'm just gonna I'm just going to use it to stroke my ego, which might be fun. But three generations from now, when we're all in the mound and it's our descendants doing this, will that have helped anything really in the scheme of things? You know, will yeah. that will our descendants be coming into will they be coming into a better, fuller, more rounded heathenry? Yeah. By because like that the, way? It, it's people like that that are saying what they're saying, like they're doing what they're doing, and almost like trying to make people feel like they're guilting people for not knowing as much as they know. Um, and in the same breath or in the next sentence, are going they're they're complaining about why things aren't more like what they want them to be, you know, or, or that people aren't adopting these worldviews or they're not, they're not educated enough. Like, well, then you're part of the problem. Damn it. Like yeah. help us out, help us help one another here. You know, <laughs> like, and like stop the, keep... it, it's that, like we talked about several times, you know, people who are just fresh coming into the worldview who aren't going to be familiar with terminology and, you know, mental concepts, things like that. And you're just absolutely shooting them down. And making them go, oh, this is awful. I do not want to be part of this. Yeah. You know, if, if you act, and I'm not saying you have to like water it down or overly sugarcoat it or anything like that. You know, we shouldn't be. We should be very firm, like, like on the brother and sister thing. No, I'm not your brother. Yeah. But we also would do better to explain these things and recognize that people can't just flick a switch. And sure. change worldviews. It's it's a slow and often painful process, and a lot of people, you know, they face that and they go, I, "Am I going to go through all this misery and money and trouble just just for people to act like this to me? I don't want that." Yeah, and I can't blame them. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can't either. You know, it's it's no wonder that we don't have more, uh, you know, heathens that uh, take this seriously to the degree you know everybody's on their own journey everybody wants to do it their way or or whatever but again some of the core fundamental aspects of it it's no wonder that uh you know people that want a community have a hard time finding one yeah i mean absolutely and it's unfortunate but i think the best thing we can do is recognizing it and yeah. then just facing it head on for what it yeah. is do stuff like this man you know just get out here and and talk about it and, and explain like, hey, you know, the, the bad apples don't don't uh, represent the entire bushel. Yeah. And, you, you know, know? Rec recognizing sometimes you're going to be in a good position for that stuff. Like, uh, you know, I am very open about being heathen, whether it's jewelry or just, you know, saying stuff conversationally. People are like, oh, are you going to church? Like, no, I actually I'm a, a Germanic pagan, a Norse pagan. Uh, explain what that means or like I'll wear shirts with imagery on it like Mjolnir's or you know yeah. runestone things like that because I recognize 
that I'm in a better place than a lot of people are to be a resource like that. You know, I'm I'm a white cis male with an accepting family that works for a company that is not religiously intolerant and who is physically capable of defending himself if necessary. I'm in a good position to kind of be out and open and say, hey, I'm doing a thing. Would you be interested and in being safe? Whereas mm -hmm. I also recognize there are a lot of people, you know, one I get a lot is a, a lot of women being afraid to wear Mjolnir's out in public because, once again, you don't know about, you know, someone who's going to take that the wrong way of a, a guy and assault you or, you know, people whose families aren't accepting and mm. they have to keep that private, but they still want community, but they can't look for it as easily as someone like I can. So yeah. it's also an important part of recognizing when you've got some privilege and what you can do and helping out those people who maybe don't have those same options to build that. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. You know, uh, not everybody has the same things going on in their lives, and I can definitely understand and appreciate why certain people are more private about it especially with how accessible basic information is to people. Yeah. Social media being a thing it has its great perks. I mean, obviously stuff like this happens where we can connect. Um, and then there's a lot of other aspects of it that, that make it toxic and terrible for people. And they have to f hide behind anonymity or, or use monikers and things to disguise themselves out of safety yeah so it's 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 wild man like it's it's it's, it's a crazy world yeah. that we live in now and the conditions I that i do a uh it's just about every month i, I miss one month recently because both of my sons are born in july and that kind of took up my weekends <laughs> but normally i do an open park move where you know it's just i got food i'm gonna do a small ritual it's open you're welcome to come i put it in groups and i did have a guy come recently uh, that, you know, he very much had to keep it on the download because the people who own, like, own the company he worked for were very religious, and he knew that if he, say, wore a Mjolnir, that there would be very serious repercussions for it. So, you know, wow. so it's like, I can't put on Facebook, you know, that I'm here or doing this, and I can't wear this or that, but, you know, I'm really glad that this is a thing, and I'm really glad to be here. It's great. Know, recognizing yeah yeah that that happens more than i would like yeah so then um we're gonna wrap this up here shortly but um you're, you're talking really quick uh quick about having monthly park moots is this something that you advertise anywhere or that you open publicly in case people that are listening and watching here are in the general vicinity where you are northeast oklahoma uh or the neighboring surrounding areas that would want to venture out is it is, it, is that something that um if people followed you or anywhere or or anything like that that they could know about yeah yeah like i said i'll usually make a facebook event and it's it's open so people can join without you know having to know me and they can invite other people and okay. i'm in a lot of the facebook groups that are kind of regional you know for pagans or heathens in oklahoma and missouri and arkansas because i'll do it in uh joplin missouri which is pretty close to where i live but it's one of the larger town verging on cities mm -hmm. that's also kind of central like it's a 30 minute drive for me but it's also about that for a lot of other people so it's kind of that nice middle yeah. ground but gotcha. uh yeah so you can either look me up on you know facebook or anything else uh Brad Shelby should pull it up uh, and you can message me or hit me up about that. There's a lot of regional Facebook groups or you can even probably just look up like Joplin, Missouri, Heathen. And because that's, you know, I make sure to use keywords for where it's at, Heathen, Park Move, things like that and yeah. find it through that. But yeah, it's usually one Saturday each month and it's totally open. I provide drinks and food and um, nice. usually some games outside for the kids. It's I do it at a park. So there's a bathroom and playground for the kids and it's a covered shelter. And 
just kind of let people get together and see the other people in their community and start building those face to face bonds. That's great. I'll, uh, if it's all right with you, then, um, since you have an, you know, active presence on, on this Facebook and mainly I'll, if it's cool with you, I'll, I'll link it in the yeah. description for people and show notes for people that are on that platform as well. And then they can see what you do and, and know about those events whenever you, uh, whenever you post them. Yeah. Cool. I'll do that then. Um, so I'm going to stop the recording here, let everybody else know that, um, uh, you know, we're, we're done, but if you want to just hang out for a minute after I stop the recording, I'll, I'll, I'll sign off with you separately. Um, but any parting words, anything else besides what we've gone over the last hour and a half ish, or however long, uh, anything else you wanted to say to people before we wrap this up? Just that, you know, it's been a blast, uh, an honor being on a podcast that, like I said, I've been a big fan of for a long time and, uh, just keep getting out there and, and doing it as best you can and building those bonds. Uh, reading those really, really dry, long books. <laughs> <laughs> There's something to be said about them. They're, you yeah. know, we're not where we are, uh, just speaking for the two of us. I mean, like, we're not where we are uh, for having neglected those those dry pieces nope. of literature. They're, uh, they're, they, they do have value. They are worth it. <laughs> yeah. All right, Brad. Well, thank you so much. And for everybody listening and watching today, thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, don't forget to check the description and show notes of this podcast for the Linktree link that has all of the ways that you can support this podcast. Follow me on all the socials. You can become a patron on Patreon. You can buy merchandise. It's all down there in the Linktree link, so do be sure to check it out. And until we see each other again in the next episode, may the gods continue to notice you. and May your ancestors smile upon you. <laughs>